Hello, big news from our friends over at DistroKid. They now have an app. This app works on iOS and Android, of course. And it's available in the Apple Store and Google Play Stores and all the stores where you buy apps. Go check it out. It's got a lot of cool features. You can upload new releases. You can get notified when you've earned royalties. Awesome. You can withdraw from the app via push notifications. A little dangerous for me, but rad. Anyways, go check it out. It's all at distrokid.com slash app. And don't forget, you can still get 30% off your DistroKid account by going to distrokid.com slash VIP slash tour stores. Have a great one. We would like to celebrate our friends and supporters over at isotope.com. Find makers of audio software for repair, mixing, and mastering. You know their goods. RX-10, Neutron 4, Ozone 11, Nectar 4. Chris and I love them. We use them. And we know you'll love them too. And right now, they're having a New Year's sale on many of their software bundles. Go to isotope.com and check it all out. And use code VRUIN10 when you check out to get your discount. Again, it's I-Z-O-T-O-P-E dot com. And enjoy. Hello, everyone, and thanks for listening. I'd like to take a second to thank our sponsors, Isotope, makers of software and plugins for audio repair, mixing, and mastering. Here at Ruinous, we use Isotope products from top to bottom for all of our audio and podcast production. Now you can subscribe to Isotope's Music Production Suite Pro for $24.99 a month or Producers Club for $19.99 a month. And you'll get access to the most up-to-date versions of the plugins as well as the latest features and updates as they're released. Head over to isotope.com now to get a 7-day free trial. That's I-Z-O-T-O-P-E dot com. And for a 10% discount on your software purchases, enter code FRET10 at checkout. F-R-E-T-1-0. Enjoy the show. Hi, guys. Hey. Hi, Joe. How are you? Very well. Good. We thought we were starting at 12, but we really started at 12.30, so it gave us a half an hour to eat lunch. Oh. So we're well fed and like feeling good. What did you have for lunch? I had leftovers. I had um, some brown rice with a meatball, and I fixed an arugula salad with olive oil and lime juice with walnuts and almonds and pine nuts and an avocado. And I had a variation of that, but um, leftovers pork from um, two nights ago in a bowl with half an avocado and some pine nuts and a little bit of sauce that I made. We're both trying to get healthy because I I got news that I have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And it was because Mm. of being overweight um, by like 50 pounds. So we've been kind of kicking it into high gear the past two months, which has been nice. Um. I'm wondering if we can pull this off. I don't know if this works. Can we identify your voices by your names so people know who's talking? Can you give me a distinctive hello in your name? Hey, my name is Joey. Thank you. Hello, my name is Roddy. Has everyone got that? (laughs) Good. Okay. (laughs) They probably record it and then they play it back when they get confused. Sure. Um... But where are you? <laughs> We're in New York City. We're in the West Village in my apartment. How's it feeling there? Does it feel like the vaccine's rolling out in New York? You know, kind of like um, spring is here, and it sort of like feels like, yeah, that's very poetic. Like the sun is coming out, and it feels like um, things are turning just a bit. Cuomo is going down. Sure the vaccines is. are rolling out. We're eating well. The record's coming out next month. We just finished a really cool video. Everything feels like, yeah, really good. Spring is here. Mm -hmm. It's our first day of spring here, too. It's not our actual first day of spring, but it is 51 degrees, I think. Oh, that's so... Is it sunny? It is, yeah. Wow, that's so great. You remember that when you lived in Seattle, right? I love the rain. I thought it was so great. And also... No one talks about these like beautiful stretches in the winter of like two weeks in December ish. And it's just like so beautiful and glorious. And you can see 
the snow on the Cascades and the Olympics. It's just like, it's so, it's a dream. Pacific Northwest is probably the prettiest place in America, besides Alaska, maybe. Gross. Oh my God, sorry. Yeah. You don't like Alaska either? No. <laughs> I love Alaska. Alaska's amazing. I've never been there. It's the only state I haven't been to. Do you feel like the rain gets on your nerves or you think it's a big lie that everybody makes up? I think because I grew up in Northern California that I learned how to ignore weather. Mm -hmm. And then right. I moved up here and I was like, I'm still going to ignore the weather. <laughs> That's nice. Yeah. It, no it doesn't ever really bother me. I feel that too. Like I grew up in Los Angeles, same thing, but in a different way. It was like everything was the same all the time. I just ignored it. But then moving to New York, like here we are, it's like unignorable. Has it been a wintry winter there? It has, right? Yeah, it's been so wintry. Tons of snow, really cold. But I, I feel like it's flown by, though. I mean, it feels like 20 years ago we started, but it also feels like we're almost in spring. Yeah. It's pretty nuts. For the era that we're in, it never has felt more like looking forward to going forward. There's so much anticipation, you know? Time is yeah. moving really fast because it's just like, please finish, please get over. What, what, what's your day-to-day -day in the last year? I mean, the day-to-day -day for the last year, if we look back a year ago, I still had a job. I was finishing my record uh, in Nashville with my friend Taylor. And we moved to California. So for the first like four months of the year, we were just making music and we were in California and Roddy's mom was sick. And then we got to New York. I mean, every, I can't even answer the question because it's like there's so many phases <laughs> of this last year for us. It's been a real journey. Like both of our moms passed away. That was a huge part of it. And then the pandemic, like, uh, yeah, we had to like basically we fled New York. Because we kind of wanted to just get out of New York also for the sake of New York. It was like two less people in this city felt good. And then my mom was sick. So we drove across the country to kind of take care of her. And when we were driving, that's when we kind of um, started brainstorming. Let's play some music together. We've been together as a couple for um, a couple of years, but we'd never played music before that. So on our way there, we started talking about that. And then we jumped into that. And that changed everything, like the music thing, the project. Mm -hmm. And still, like on a day-to-day, -day, that's what we do. Like we do the project. We have a lot of different projects within the project. Every like three or four months over the last year has been like a different set change. Like California mm -hmm. and then coming back to New York. And Roddy's apartment burned down like four years ago. And he was able to move back in it finally over September-ish. And then we got signed, which has been really nice. I mean, I, I feel like without a job, it's been a nice welcome to to be signed and have like this sense of obligation of like needing to, you know, we have to figure out video stuff and mixing and mastering and logistics for what we're doing for merchandise and vinyl. Like it's been nice to have like a sense of like, you have to get this done because yeah. we didn't really have that before. And it's been really great. That's what I keep saying. If nothing else, like signing to a label gives you deadlines and yeah. that's appreciated. Yeah. Well, it doesn't sound like you had any, any time to get into any bad habits mm -hmm. over the last year. Um, but maybe you did. Not so much like eating. I know, but isn't that the truth? Like bad habits, like this, uh, pandemic really sort of breeds that like you can get back to bad habits really easy. Like I know, a lot of people in my peripheral world have like gone back to drugs or whatever. There's been a lot of suicide. There's been a lot of like mental illness and yeah, a lot of like bad habits that have killed people, honestly. Yeah. I've, I've known of a couple of people that had the time to think that they could get back into drug use and then, but, but then they had enough time to be like, uh, I think I've, I think I can handle it. Yeah, because mm -hmm. you're behind closed doors and there's very little accountability. Yeah. We uh, smoked. We started smoking. That was a bad habit. Mm -hmm. That's There you go. There's mm -hmm. one. <laughs> we, um, we quit together when we first got together. <laughs> and then we started again. And then we stopped again. And now we might be dabbling. 
just <laughs> a dabble. One a day, one a week. No, let's just say we're smoking for the week. We're going to be done today, though. Yeah, this is our last day. We started on Sunday, and we were like, let's just do it oh. for a couple of days, and then yeah. I think we're done today. It's nice to be able to revisit a bad habit and remember how shitty it makes you feel. Yeah, to be like, oh yeah, this is not good. <laughs> Like this, we feel gross, like doing this. Yeah. It is so Just enjoyable lot, though. I mean, I feel like, I think it's important to acknowledge that smoking is so great and we love it, but it's the worst thing you can do for yourself. Yeah. There's a lot of romance in smoking and I don't know why. I do love you not it. smoke? I, I quit. Congratulations. Congratulations. Good for you. Good one. A Jack. long time ago. Fantastic. Um, have you seen Blue in the Face? Mm-mm. What is it? It is a movie starring Harvey Keitel, and Harvey Keitel runs a smoke shop on the corner in Brooklyn, and all these people just come and visit him, and it's this crazy cast of characters, including Roseanne and Michael J. Fox and Lou Reed, <laughs> and Jim Jarmusch does kind of a talking head spot where he's talking about quitting smoking, and it's really funny and great. I once saw um, John Waters on David Letterman when I was younger, and Dave goes, so uh, you like to smoke? And John goes, David, I am a cigarette. (laughs) (laughs) How about good habits? Any good habits that you're going to keep? Um, the other day, Joey turned me on to this sort of like self-helpy sort of podcast, if you will. Mm-hmm. This woman who seems really smart. And um, we listened to her. We went on a long drive the other day. We drove up to Provincetown, which is like five hours. And we listened to this podcast. And uh, she was really cool. And she has like sort of a language and tools for like accountability and bravery and just sort of like um, getting through life Mm -hmm. and since we listened to that her tools have been coming up her vernacular has been coming up in our conversations and we kind of used her lessons in a way that's not cheesy at all all right helpful her name well i think you probably know who she is or listeners will know who she is Brene brown do you know her i know of her That's all I know. She's cool. She's really cool. She seems like on paper, like, ew. But then you listen to her and you're like, oh, she just got lucky and did a cool TED Talk. And -hmm. then she just got super, she has the most viewed TED Talk in history. Oh. And she's sort of just like, she's a, but she's a scientist and a professor and she studies shame for a living. And so. Whoa. Yeah. So through her studies, she talks about people's responses to themselves and other people through the lens of shame and how to remove shame from your communication. And, you know, I think even in COVID times, we're all kind of mad at something and it, we kind of know it's the target is like COVID, but not really like there's so many other factors that we are victim to bad leadership as for, you know, our president and, um, people not being willing to participate in safety and there's a lot of reasons to be angry and I think when you talk about like how you feel about yourself when you're angry it can get kind of intense like a lot of people you know they're blaming themselves for the problem right now like in a lot of ways like it's my fault I don't have a job or it's my fault that I'm feeling you know sad or anxious and it's it's nice to like think about our our thoughts in, in terms of shame and, and how we're trying to make ourselves feel bad because the circumstances are bad or something like that. It makes me start thinking about my hidden shame. I know. I hadn't really thought about it. Like I grew up as a, um, like my family was Catholic mm-hmm. and I talked to my older sister about it the other day. I was like, do you ever listen to this woman named Brene Brown? She was like, yeah. And I like got into it, like our childhood and growing up with like in religion is a shameful place to come from. Yeah. But like like you, Joe, I hadn't thought about shame in that yeah. way. But anyway, that's a habit. That's a good habit. I feel like we were kind of we're kind of on the brink of picking up. Just a a powerful and smart way to communicate. Yeah. That's great. What about you? Good habits? Mm-hmm. Um 
I can't think of any. I it's think also I... okay if you don't have any. Like, I think the pressure should be off to, like, if you didn't develop any good habits this year, like, that was the perfect time not to because it sucked. <laughs> the world sucked. You and know, it still and my sucks. house is, I'm kind of a, I can be kind of a neat freak. And when I was touring a lot, I'd come home and I'd, I have all this post tour energy mm-hmm. and I'd clean it. My house has been the filthiest it's been since. It's fine. I can remember. Do you get home from tour and immediately unpack your clothes or do you keep a suitcase in your room for two weeks? I keep a suitcase in my room for two weeks and I wear the clean ones Mm -hmm. and then throw them into the dirt. Sure. Do you live with anyone? My roommates are my wife and my six-year-old son. Oh, wow. Six is a great age. And Sonny, my dog, who's a golden doodle. Um. There's this idea that everything's going to be different when we get back to normal. I kind of think everything's going to go back to the same. Mm-hmm. That's not a scientific researched thought, but I, that's my gut feeling. I agree. Do you think we're just going to have the roaring 20s and then slowly slip back into normal social behavior? Kind of for me. I feel like there's a big adjustment with, you know, the uprising and Black Lives Matter and sort of accountability of like, you know, behavior that doesn't seem like it would go away. And that seems like a big part in moving forward besides the pandemic and besides like what we've gone through in that regards. Amidst that, it feels like our country has changed. I feel like in terms of like social justice, in terms of what people are thinking about now, I have to think that things are going to be different. And Mm -hmm. I think the needle has been moved for sure. And I think it still keeps getting moved. I mean, honestly, Seattle is a huge part of that. I mean, the, the activism in Seattle is, you know, what you guys do there is right around the world. I mean, I've never been in a more political city in my life. When I think about behaviors of just, like normal social stuff outside of social justice. I'm kind of under the impression that things are going to go back to normal. Um, We were talking to a friend who was over for dinner and he was talking about how he wanted to open up a bathhouse for those who are listening. (laughs) Roddy and I are gay, uh, but a bathhouse is just where guys go and, and have sex and do stuff. Um, But he was talking about opening a bathhouse. And the big question was like, are people going to be going to bathhouses anymore after all of this stuff? I was like, absolutely. But it was a good question. I think, I don't know. I just see the way people are already acting. It's like, you know, it's spring is here coming and it's like spring fever, but it's also like COVID's ending. And I already see how people are like wanting to travel and fly and how people already do that. And I'm like, uh, I don't think we're going to be changed forever. Yeah, there is a hypersensitive sort of like attention drawn to like cleanliness and like germaphobes are like really like, uh, like I've never been that way. I've always eaten like anything off the ground or whatever. Me but too. I've kind of changed in that way. Like, oh, like, yeah, being in New York, like, oh, don't touch things and put your <laughs> hand to your mouth. I would never have done that before. Now I'm a little different. True. I never cared. I would hold on to the subway rail and stuff like that no yeah. problem and put my hand in my mouth yeah <laughs> i wonder if germaphobes have been at complete peace in the last year mm-hmm. or it's been utter hell for them it seems like it go either way they're like told you that's a good question yeah are germaphobes <laughs> like, comfortable or i are told they you freaking? all i yeah. fucking told you all now everyone keep doing this yeah yeah but germaphobes are typically more sick often aren't they mm. I don't know. Maybe. I think they are. It's true. Everyone should just believe me. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys haven't played these songs live yet, have you? Mm-mm. We play them over there at the piano over there. Joey gets out his guitar and we play like um, unplugged versions of them just for fun and to reacquaint ourselves with the songs. Because when we wrote them, we didn't really even think about We weren't even really thinking about a record. We were just like creating stuff. And then like we made a record and it became clear like, oh yeah, we are going to perform these songs. So we've been sort of relearning them over there on that piano, but only in that context 
uh, unplugged. Yeah, it's the same way like you would probably equate it to like demoing stuff out. That's kind of yeah. just how Roddy and I wrote our record. Like there was no like, okay, and when we take him to the studio, it's going to be different. It's like we just did everything on the computer and we wrote a lot of the music on the fly. Like if Roddy had an idea he'd been working on, I would listen to it and just start playing guitar. Lyrically, that was the same way. So when we got signed, it was like, oh, yeah, we have to like learn all this stuff, <laughs> which is a normal. I know it's a normal problem for a lot of bands, like especially in the studio. You kind of just write stuff that needs to go in. But that was our entire record was like, I mean, the most we ever sat with the song was probably like, would you say like a week? But mostly they were done pretty quickly each song. So, yeah, we definitely have to relearn a lot of them. We um, already have, actually. I mean. I feel like we're pretty much there with learning all of our songs. It didn't if take that long. If we could just get someone to come in here and mic us in a really professional way, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we could put on a really good show. Yes. Have you done any streaming? No. We're kind of in this weird spot where we've only put out three songs. Mm -hmm. And so it's like we want to stream it in a way that's like good. We don't want to do like yeah. a Instagram live. And it's like we don't want to play new songs before the record's out and it's expensive to do video and audio. Yeah. And so it's like, what do you do? Like, do you just do like a really simple setup and just do like different iterations of the songs or do you get a full band and that bring that in? It's like a full band and then re renting a rehearsal space and mm -hmm. COVID and you know, where are we going to do? Like, it's a lot of questions, but we'll figure it out. The plan is to definitely play live. We're excited about that. We just actually, um, we're going to sign to a booking agency pretty soon, All which right. is exciting. Yeah. Well, in the meantime, I want to play Daddy. Does that sound cool? Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. All we right. like that song. I do, too. Here we go.
That's Hook City, that song. Thank you. That's where we quarantined. <laughs> I think you did. Yeah, we quarantined in Hook City. We spent months <laughs> there. It was dreamy. <laughs> All by ourselves in a little A-frame mm-hmm. in Hook City. I think you're going to have people... You're going to have a lot of sing-along on that number. Yeah, it's exciting Fingers to crossed. think about that. I love yeah. a sing-along. I think people might be adding some rah-rah stuff. I had, <laughs> I don't want to do it now, but I had some response to it. I'll... Yeah, I love that stuff. So, you guys, did you record this in the apartment? No, like we were saying, we, we were driving across the country to take care of my mom or help mm-hmm. take care of my mom, but... Before we got to my mom, we had to quarantine for a couple weeks, we knew. So knowing we were going to do that, we were like, what can we do to pass the time? Let's just get, so we had like a microphone sent to where we were going and then a, a, a keyboard and that I could play keyboard in. But we had my piano in the house. We went to this little place in Oxnard, California, which is like 50 miles north of mm-hmm. Los Angeles that my mom has. So we sort of hold up there for a while just to quarantine. And that's where we did like uh, most of the recording we did in that in that little house just by ourselves. Are there real drums on that? I have to ask. Mm-mm. No. Mm-hmm. We no, should lie, honestly. <laughs> We were somewhere recently in um, P-Town, and we played that song, the video, for our friends, and John Cameron Mitchell was there. Do you know John Cameron Mitchell? He created Hedwig. Are you familiar with that? But he was like, we played, and he's like, after we were all leaving, he's like, I love that song. The real drums just feel (laughs) so good. (laughs) And what do you say to that? We're just like, yeah. Yeah. I would have probably scoffed at using fake drums, but we didn't have, I mean, the access to a studio or, you know, we didn't really, we didn't really want to bring anybody in as well in the process. So my friend, Joey Howard, he plays bass um, for a few projects and it was just kind of like bass was needed on a few songs for sure. But otherwise we just did everything ourselves. It really sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Real drums or, or not. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. And I also, it makes me think, especially that song, I think I've been listening to that song the most, but when you do tour, do you think you'll do a full band? That's the plan for sure. I mean, I'm, Roddy plays in bands. I played in a band and I did all throughout high school too. It's like, I need a band. Like I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm, yeah, for sure. The reason I ask is because. Do you want to be in our band? Yes, (laughs) I do. Yeah, we do. And, um. Especially with Daddy, I was just imagining you guys both playing guitar and just a sampler in the middle. Mm-hmm. Kind of suicide. There's something suicide I'm. We've right. thought about that. Yeah. I like that. Also, like, we're two gay guys. And, like, when we put out our song, like, it really struck a nerve with our community, you know, like the gay community. What it, it was just like it was a video and it's like us in our underwear and stuff. And it was like people like not because it's us in our underwear, but like it was an expression or a, a, a statement that sort of like a lot of people like, yeah, got into. It. And then we were thinking about like, how would we do this? And in the gay world, it feels like like I've seen in gay bars or like gay venues, a lot of situations where people get up on stage and play to track. You know, or like drag yeah. queens, for example, like always, like there's never a band involved. They always played a track. And even I think when I first saw Right Said Fred, I think they played to track. <laughs> but the point being, like, if we were to go out and play just gay venues, we could be that kind of a band. But we're not that kind of a band. Yeah. It would be way cheaper, probably, to tour that yeah. way. But I don't know. I just think the songs, there's a, our new single, Stoner, that's coming out in a couple of weeks. It just has to be live. And also, like, there's a lot of vocal stacks. There's a lot of guitar right. parts. There's a lot of synth parts. Yeah. It just kind of needs more people. Yeah, I guess. It's, and again, it's probably most mostly that song that I think of. Also, the kills. Kind of just, mm. I was just. Oh, yeah. You know, that just loud yeah. duo. Kind yeah. Of I'm thing. not mad at that kind of presentation. Yeah, me neither. Suicide or the kills, like, I love. It's so stark and looks so cool. Yeah. Um. There's a world that we could figure that out, but you can do both. Yeah. Mm. Well, that was, we originally talked about like three versions. It's like piano, acoustic guitar, Mm. full band. And like, what does it look like to run tracks and stuff like that? We're on part one. (laughs) 
<laughs> Just finishing part one. There's a lot of video and imagery attached to this project. Was the whole idea a, a broader package of visuals and music? Or did you start making videos once the songs were complete? Everything that we did was step by step. Like that's the okay. most honest way to answer that. I mean, we yeah. we Roddy it was Roddy's idea. We were like driving through Texas and he's like, let's make music. And originally it was just to send to our friends or something like that. Like, here's what we're up to, like just fun. And then when we wrote songs like Daddy, that's when we realized like we had a good chemistry and we both it was just really fun. And it was like in a very natural way, it was like, let's talk about making a music video. And then, you know, when we released that song, it got a lot of attention. And, and I think the Rolling Stone article online helped with that a lot. And yeah, I think it informed how we moved forward. It was like, we thought it was cool. We liked it. It was mm -hmm. something that we were both interested in doing. And it's fun to be creative in quarantine or not. But I think the reception of the queer community specifically was like, oh, this is cool because I've never seen anything that looks like this before um, between two, you know, boyfriends and it just felt very fresh and a lot of people resonated with it. So to answer your question in a very long way, it, it's been step by step. The only intention we had for our project was just to be creating a space for us to be honest and just sort of do what we want to do. And the rest kind of followed. Yeah. We've had really good luck making videos. Like it's really fun for us and we both like work well off each other. And it's just really fun. Like that sort of dictated what we were doing too. Like this last one, we just finished one over the weekend and going into that one, like until the last minute we had, well, we kind of figured out what we were going to do, but, uh, yeah, it's surprising how things can just take shape in a quick manner. Yeah. Another aspect of this whole project is chosen family. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, that again was something that sort of was dictated by like the sort of the reception we got from the first video that we put out was like two big guys in their underwear dancing around and a lot of gay people around the world were like, oh, like really applauding that. It was like a sense of body positivity and proactive like sexual behavior it was things that people hadn't seen and we got so much um, response back from people that it sort of for us it started to create a sort of community around what we were doing and we just started like we've been in touch with like everybody that's been into the band since and it just became clear to us that there's like um, an obligation or a responsibility that we have doing what we do to make use of feeding that community and bringing people together and just like creating a space for gay people to exist in. So we started like one of the, we, we're making a fanzine that comes out uh, next month. That's a big part of it. But then we also started a pen pal program, which is aiming to sort of like get us and people off the internet and off social platforms and sort of engaging uh, in a real way. So we've like have like almost 500 people in the pen pal program of Chosen Family. And we're currently, I say we, but I mean Joey, we are uh, matching everybody up. So everybody has a pen pal across the world. And they will start communicating with each other via mail. And that felt like a real physical sort of tangible way to sort of bring people together. Yeah. But the whole sense of that just started really basically from people who started getting involved with us and what we were doing in a real honest way. Yeah. Well, one thing, the pen pal thing is mm -hmm. really exciting to me. That's cool. Did you sign up for it? I haven't yet. I'm going to as soon as we're done talking. Oh, shit. Jump on it. I think it'll go a lot of places. To yeah. like chosen family. I mean, I think eventually it'll become like a place for like activism and support, you know, I think is a big thing. And for me as an artist, I've heard a lot of people say nice things about me or my band, but probably like the most rewarding thing is when someone says, I finally see like somebody like me or somebody that's doing what I want to see. Like that's kind of like a very pure expression of, of, you know, how someone views your art. And I think that was really important to say, to see, like, there's so many people all, all over the world who don't really feel like they fully can click into anything. 
And it's, yeah. it's fun for us to think about chosen family as like this, our community, our people. And, uh, it's, it can go in so many places, you know, and it's fun to think about what a tour would look like with that mindset. You know, it's, is it just music? Is it other things? Is it, there's so many queer people who are making cool shit and it's like to be able to highlight those people, it just seems like there's not really a place for that. Mm -hmm. right now that's doing it in a broad way broadway um yeah <laughs> sorry the whole project just seems to be so inspired and you know the videos obviously the music and then this chosen family thing you guys seem to be on fire right now thanks i'm glad it looks like that it does afar. it really does <laughs> we feel busy yeah, we feel yeah, it's like a lot of stuff. It is, a lot and we're things. doing it. Polyvinyl is amazing. Mm -hmm. They are an incredible support, and it's it's so nice to have a label that can, you know, we have these big ideas, and then they're like helping us figure out how to do it. It's a lot of stuff. Yeah, but it's you're right. It's nice to be encouraged. Like the first conversation we had with them, we were like. Yeah, we have really kind of lofty ideas and kind of what was the adjective that we kept saying back and forth with them? Like queer. No, uh, <laughs> I don't know. It queer was like ideas. high aspirational sort of ideas. And they were just like always so encouraging. They were yeah. like, yes, aim for that. Aim for that. Like the whole idea of the fanzine is insane. It's like we're pooling like um, work from everybody in the chosen family, sending us stuff and people that we like, and we're putting it all together. I mean, it's not that hard, but it's like, you know, it was, uh, it's a lot of moving parts. Yeah. Well, I look forward to the expansion of chosen family. Thank you. We do too. Um, do you guys have any music in your lives right now? You can't stop listening to you have anything on repeat? Yeah, I mean, I feel it's not going to be that amazing to probably a lot of people, but that's okay. Just I remember that I'm gay. Um, I really love SZA's new singles a lot. The last two she put out, I listened to those a lot. I like Julian Baker's new record. She just came out with last week. Haley Williams came out with a new record a couple weeks ago. Um I can't remember anything. It also doesn't have to be new music. I keep listening to that record. What's that record that, that we were singing this morning? Waxahachie. Yeah, I keep listening mm. to that Waxahachie record. I really love that record. Yeah. And then Mary, uh, Sarah Mary Chapin. She's good. I don't know her. She's from Australia. She's really good. What have you been listening to? Mostly... Uh, my friend has been sending me psychedelic African music. Mm. Ooh, psychedelic. Uh, yeah, and most of the, most of it's Zambian, and it's mm -hmm. uh, there's a little Zambian, like an eight minute documentary on Zambian psychedelic rock that I recommend. Wow, looking at it's fun to have stuff to go to right now. Sarah Mary Chadwick is that woman's name, not Chapin. Okay. Apologies, Sarah. I listen to a lot of pop music. I feel like it's nice to balance out the weirdness of the world. I listen to a lot of Janet Jackson. I listen to pretty much anything that's like R&B. I do love a lot of rap. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's like indie rock. I mean, I grew up on like, uh, you know, I don't say grew up, but I, I felt like really fell in love with like music with American football and Page of the Lion and shit like that. So I still listen to that pretty regularly as well. Um, Speaking of Julian Baker, do you hear a little bazon in that? Yes, as well as in Phoebe Bridgers. But it makes sense because both of them grew up Christian. And they were like, I'm pretty positive both of them were. I could be wrong about this. But I think, you know, very tied to the church. They might still be, but... Um, I think they, the knack for like indie rock for Christian kids of like, especially my generation, you know, the, this like indie Christian music scene in the Southeast and West coast was the gateway into a lot of indie, indie rock stuff. And I think David Bazan was probably the first person to kind of take us there in a way. Mm -hmm. And, um, so yeah, you can totally hear David Bazan, I think. And I, I mean, maybe more Elliot 
Smith and Phoebe Bridgers, but there's that there's that like rawness that I think everybody like Julian Baker and Phoebe Bridgers appreciates about David Bazan, for sure. You know what else I've been listening to is that Sleaford Mods single uh, called Mork and Mindy. I haven't oh, heard it's it. It's a great song. Is that a new song? It's a new song featuring Billy Nomates. I think I'm saying her name right. It's really mm. cool. I don't know that one. Mark and Mindy, though, is it like uh, it's obviously referencing the program? Mark and Mindy. Yes, I'm. I'm assuming. That's fun. Nanu yeah. Nanu. Do you know that, Joey? Yeah. I wrote for that TV show. Oh, oh yeah, my that's God. Right. I, re- I read that you wrote for that. <laughs> You were uh, so young. Yeah. How old were you? When you um, I don't remember. Little. It was a long time ago, but yeah, I was a big, yeah. big, big head heard, writer. Prodigy. Right. Mirth, mirth was your concept, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that was, yep. A lot of people don't know that. Thanks for doing that research, Joe. Of course. It's big. Um, I, I'm going to let you guys go, but I have a one more question for you. Okay. Cool. What do you most look forward to when we get back to normal? What are you going to do first? I really, like people say a lot, but I really miss live shows. And the reason we live in New York is because we love to do social things like live shows, art shows, opera, theater, whatever. I love being on top of a million different people. And I'm really looking forward to like being crowded shoulder to shoulder, breathing in each other's faces and like particularly in a loud uh, rock setting. I am looking forward to just the prospect of doing whatever I want. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, Just kidding. I'm not kidding. I'm somebody that's like very detail oriented. So the fact that we have to sort of noodle our way around our plans all the time, I'm just really looking forward to not thinking about it. It was kind of like when the news over the last four years, it's like you always thought about what our shitty president was saying and it's just been so nice to not really have to watch the news lately. <laughs> and it's yeah. kind of the same thing with like plan making. I'm just really ready to be over like these hurdles and obstacles. All right. Well, one thing I'm looking forward to is a show with Mr. Heavenly and Man on Man with one of the singers and the keyboardist for Mr. Heavenly also has a band called Man Man. <gasps> oh yeah, I knew that. So I think Man Man can headline, and Mister Heavenly and Man on Man can open for him. Mm, not sure what about that. Um, that setup. Maybe Man on Man heads on, right, but ma- no. okay. Let's see. <laughs> Just Mister Heavenly, <laughs> and then Man Man, and then yes, no. Okay. What if we do a triple headlining show? That's fine. We all play two hours. We only have fifty minutes worth of music anyway. That yeah. sounds like a that great That sounds lineup. so fun. Yeah. God. We yeah, should do it, though. Do I mean, hopefully, sure. Mr. Heavenly. I hope to see you guys on a stage, Mr. Yeah. Heavenly and Same. Man on Man, at least. Same. Yeah, just talk to our people. We can see if I we will. can work something out. Yeah. Talk to us. Thanks. <laughs> oh, I'll be playing. I'll be playing drums. I forgot. Yay. Oh, yeah, cool. That's very easy for me great. now. Don't have I'm to move so the drum kit either. I'm so glad that worked out. That takes yeah. one thing off our list of things to do. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. You do have to become gay, just so you know, to play in our become band. Become yeah. gay. You can work that out yourself, but okay. that's kind of the, what's going on. Okay. No problem. I can cool. do that. It's easy. Yeah. I can give you a few tips. Do I, I just moved to New York? Basically. Or stay yeah. in Seattle. <laughs> Let's <laughs> actually stay in Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> Thank All you right. so much for having us. Yeah, thank you guys. We really and I really it. do hope to see you in the rock world soon. You will. Sure. Relatively soon. See you soon. All right, yeah. take care of yourselves. Bye-bye. Bye, Bye. Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.